Hello, everyone. I'm Evo Dalder, president of the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, and thank you for joining us from across the globe for an important and very timely conversation. I want to also thank our members and partners for joining us via YouTube for this on the record program. This event is part of a four part series that is entitled A Century of Global Leadership, which marks the Council's centennial anniversary, which will take place early in 2022. Over the next few months, we will have an opportunity to look back at our history over these 100 years, a history of our engagement in the world seen through the lens of one of the oldest public affairs organizations in the United States. From its birth in 1922 as a worldly outpost in the provincial hotbed of isolationism, the Chicago Council on Global Affairs has helped Chicagoans understand the importance of America's global engagement. The Council led the great debate over American participation in World War II here in this city of Chicago, and it has since driven discussions over the nation's role in the world. While much has changed over the past 100 years, the fundamental purpose that brought 23 women and men together in 1922 remains essential today. Then and now, the Council has helped people understand what is happening in the world and why it matters to them. This series, uh, looking back at our history, is made possible by the incredibly genera generous support uh, of our sponsors, an engaged and diverse group of supporters who are committed to making sure that everyone can participate in the global conversation that affects all of us. We're grateful for their persistent and unwavering support and a full list of sponsors is available on our website. And I hope you will consider as well uh, to invest in our work as we look forward to our next century. Now, for part two of our Century of Global uh, Leadership series, we're pleased to have with us renowned historians who will explore the role and the recurrence of isolationism in American political discourse and foreign policy, and the parallels that can be drawn from our nation's past to our current and future global outlooks. And so it's my great honor to introduce our distinguished panelists. First, Margaret McMillan is joining us from Toronto, where she is the professor of history at the University of Toronto and an emeritus professor as well of international history at Oxford University. She's currently a trustee at the Imperial War Museum. Her research specializes in British imperial history and international history of the 19th and 20th century. Professor McMillan, it's wonderful to have you uh, with us today from Toronto. Thanks, thank you very much. Also joining us is Douglas Irwin, the John French Professor of Economics at Dartmouth College. He has previously served on President Ronald Reagan's Council of Economic Advisors and in the International Finance Department Division uh, sorry, of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System in Washington, D.C., and he joins us from Hanover, New Hampshire. Doug, wonderful to have you with us as well. Great to be here. Thank you. Last but not least, Charles Kupchin, who is a professor of international affairs at Georgetown University and a senior fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations. He served as a special assistant to the president and senior director for European affairs in the National Security Council uh, under President Obama. Uh, all three are prolific authors and their books, which are particularly relevant for the topics that we're gonna to discuss today are available for purchase from the bookseller. Links are available on our website and shortly in the chat. Doug, Charles, Margaret, thanks so much for being with us here today. I really look forward to this conversation. And let me start with a, a question to each of you and perhaps uh, Margaret, you can, you can start. We're approaching as I mentioned, the Council Centennial. Can you describe the political climate in the 1920s when the Council was created here in Chicago and how that fostered a mood of isolationist sentiment? I think the United States in the 1920s was divided as it often is over whether or not it should be engaged and how it should be engaged with the rest of the world. I think sometimes that isolationism in the 1920s is overstated. And there were a great many people like the people who founded the, the Chicago Council or Council on Foreign Relations in New York who cared deeply about the rest of the world, thought the United States should be engaged. And as far as we can tell, because there were no public opinion surveys in those days, more Americans probably supported the US joining the League of Nations than opposed it. But I think what began to happen in the 1920s was perhaps a reassertion of an older strand of isolationism, which has been there, I think, really since the founding of the Republic. 
this view that the colonists had broken away from a corrupt and decadent Europe. They were in a new world. They were creating a new world and they didn't need any part of, of the world they had left behind. And that, I think, is something that runs like a strand through American thinking about the rest of the world and about itself. There are other strands, of course, that the United States has an obligation, in fact, to get involved with the, in the world because it is such an exemplary model for the rest of the world or it's such a powerful country that it should be engaged. What was also happening, I think, in the 1920s is there was a reaction to the war itself, um, a growing feeling, particularly in English-speaking countries, that it all, had all been a, a terrible mistake, a terrible waste, a terrible catastrophe, that the Germans were perhaps not guilty of starting it, that they were unfairly blamed. You began to get uh, books coming out saying it was really the arms manufacturers, there were people plotting to create the war, and that the United States had been dragged in illegitimately by President Woodrow Wilson and his administration. And so I think what you have in the 1930s is a very important debate going on within the United States. And many people in the United States who continue to advocate for engagement in the world and, and a lot of others who are saying, no, we, we tried it once, we just tried it, it didn't work. Doug, uh, how do you see the political climate? Uh, do you think this was a continuation of the strand that Margaret des described that in fact started uh, at the time of the revolution? And, and, and in some ways continues uh, through American history. Was there something unique in the 1920s? As, on the other hand, as Margaret also puts forward on in terms of the war uh, and, and its particular aftermath. And of course, there was an economic issue that was starting to come up uh, in the 1920s too. How, how would you describe sort of the, the, the climate that existed that, that allows the 1930s to become uh, what it, what it uh, ultimately would become in terms of isolationism? I think Professor McMillan really described very well um, two features of, of the 1920s. One is that we were a divided country. It wasn't as though there was a vast majority in favor of one policy or not. And that actually has deep roots in American history, going back to the revolution and post-revolutionary period, when at least in terms of trade policy, which is what I tend to study, uh, the country was divided between international engagement, promoting trade, uh, involvement in the world, and uh, being fearful of foreign competition and its impact on the domestic economy. And I think that this comes out in the, um, uh, during the period right after World War I as well. Um, President Wilson had uh, very much been in favor of uh, international engagement, um, including in economic arrangements. Uh, he had reduced tariffs uh, pretty significantly in the Tariff Act of uh, 1913. Uh, and the re reaction by the Republicans, which, who, which was the isolationist party, was very much against that. They want to raise tariffs. They want to uh, restrict immigration. And so there's... It gets caught up in partisanship, um, a wholesale uh, rejection. Uh, but that said, I think as Professor McMillan suggested, there were there was the groundwork laid for future engagement uh, uh, during World War One and thereafter. And we could talk a bit about the Great Depression and how that really uh, changed the direction of U.S. trade policy, particularly after World War Two. Uh, we'll come back to the to to that, which of course I think is a is a really important aspect to to think about what was happening, not only in the 30s, but as you said, uh, afterwards. Uh, uh, but Charlie, uh, your, your perspective of, of, of sort of the 20s um, uh, and, and the climate that exists in this immediate post-war period, of course, this, uh, this thrust that, that uh, Margaret also talked about, about believing that the war had been uh, unnecessary if, uh, and, and, and trying to figure out a new way to deal with international politics, which Wilson also brought uh, two to four uh, in, in his own thinking. How did that play out and what other political issues do, uh, do you look at when you think about the reemergence of an isolationist sentiment back in the 20s? Ivo, I think, I think what I, <clears throat> the way I'd put it on an intuitive basis is, is that the 20s were a reversion to the norm. Uh, and it's important, I think, for folks to realize, those of us who live in America today, who came of age during the Cold War. You, you and I, Eva, went to grad school together. We've served in government together. We have been living in a fish tank in which internationalism is the default position. And we think about isolationism as this deformation. Well, if you go back and you look at American history, isolationism was the default position for the entire of the 19th century, really until the Spanish-American War. And the internationalists, we're the weirdos. And it really does go back to the founders when George Washington said in the farewell address, commercial connections with everyone, political connections with no one. 
Then we get to the end of the 19th century and we have two runs at engaging in the world, at contemplating entanglement. One is the War of, eight, uh, of, of 1898, the Spanish-American War, in which McKinley tells us we're going to liberate Cuba from the Spanish and get rid of imperialism. What happens? We turn into an empire, right? We colonize Cuba, the Port Puerto Rico, we annex Hawaii, we colonize the Philippines, we annex Samoa, Hawaii, the, you know, the Guam. The, suddenly, we're doing what we said to everybody we wouldn't do. And Americans say, no, thank you. Then Wilson comes along and he says, well, I'm going to learn the lessons of McKinley and I'm going to do this as an idealist. I'm not going to expand as an imperial power. I'm going to expand to save the world for democracy. Americans don't like that either. World War I was pretty ugly. And that then lands us in the 1920s, which was in some ways a reversion to where we were before. One final comment, I think it's important to distinguish between the 20s and the 30s in the following respect. In the 20s, we were still deeply engaged economically. This was the era of what uh, Christopher McNichols out in Portland, uh, Portland State calls, uh, what did he call it? Internationalist isolationism. And what he meant by that is we didn't wanna take on commitments abroad, but we still wanted geopolitical influence through economic engagement. Banks, not tanks, as Bear Brownlow would put it. That actually ends with the depression when we go into an isolationism that is not only geopolitical, but also economic. Uh, that's, that really sets us up really nicely, uh, 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 Charlie, sort of to, to think about those two aspects of the isolation internationalism uh, spectrum, the, the geopolitical, and which is, and particularly in this interwar period is so important, and, and, and the geoeconomic. And, and, and Margaret, I want to come back to you and, and as, as, as the preeminent historian of the of, of how the World War I was ended uh, with, with your book, 1919. Uh, uh, to what extent was inherent in the way that war was ended, inherent in the way that Wilson thought about the war and how to end the war, uh, almost the inevitability of uh, a, a counter push, a more isolationist push that came uh, towards in, in, in American politics, not only in party political terms, which, which Doug mentioned, but perhaps as a sort of an essential un-American way of doing business to which uh, the, the, a reaction was formed. How, how should we think about that? Well, I think we have to remember what a tragedy the First World War was, um, less so for the United States, not that it wasn't a tragedy for the United States, but the United States came out stronger and um, stronger economically, perhaps stronger politically. It took losses, but not on the scale of the Europeans. But I think there was a general feeling around the world and which I think Americans shared was that the war had been so catastrophic, something better must come out of it. And when it appeared that something better wasn't coming out of it, I think there was a, a, a disillusionment. I think the expectations were so high, partly because the war itself had been so dreadful and I think they were encouraged by Woodrow Wilson's own rhetoric. I mean, he was a fantastic speaker. He, he was one of the great orators of his time. And he inspired people. And he talked about a world safe for democracy. He talked about a world that would be better. He talked about a fairer world. He talked about the League of Nations. He portrayed a sort of world which was probably going to be impossible to achieve. And so I think the corresponding disappointment was perhaps even greater. And I think he himself recognized it as he, as he was going on the ship to Europe that took him to the Paris Peace Conference. He said to one of the people with him, he said, I sense an agony of disappointment, you know, that I, you know, that just, there's so much expectation out there. I think he himself was afraid of it. And I think also, you know, I think something we, we, we also perhaps need to think about with the United States. I mean, I think the history matters, the reaction to the war matters and geography matters. You know, the United States has been enormously privileged because for most of its history, it has never been threatened directly on its own soil by foreign forces. I mean, since the revolution, when of course it was threatened, but it's had a relatively peaceful Canada to the North. I mean, we once had a plan to invade you, but you're very lucky we didn't carry it out. Um, Mexico has always been um, smaller, weaker than the United States and the two oceans are there. And I think, you know, if you go to someone like Kansas, even today, you get a sense that 
this center of America is very far from the rest of the world. And, and why does the rest of the world matter? The irony, I think, it seems to me, is that by the 1930s, and I think the depression is huge, as Professor Owen and Professor Kutchin have said, depression is huge in turning countries inwards. The irony is, of course, that thanks to aviation, it is becoming more possible to attack the United States just at a time when isolation was, isolationism is reinforced. I mean, that's just one of the ways in which history often creates paradoxes. Uh, Doug, on, on the, just to the economics here, how the United States was engaged in, in the world and in, in, in an economic sense. And if there is a history of isolationism, it didn't really affect much of our commercial uh, relationships always had uh, some connection to the rest of the world, even immediately after the revolution. And of course, in the 20s, we do. So So why then this sudden uh, sense of no, this is not what we want to do? Uh, why turn off that economic engagement mechanism, which in the 1930s uh, either causes or accentuates the, the Great Depression uh, in itself, a big debate? Uh, on, on how to think about it. Well, why, where does that come from? How should we understand it? Well, the US, even from the mid to late 19th century, is the world's largest economy. Uh, and you know we're a continental-sized single market. So foreign trade is just not really important the way it is for many European countries, which are much smaller, for Canada and for others. So we could sort of afford to not really worry about the rest of the world in terms of commerce, in terms of our own national economic welfare. And here's where actually the depression really does change things because um, just as uh, Professor McMillan and you spoke about how the Midwest was sort of the center of, uh, of isolation of sentiment, if you will, it was farm prices that collapsed the most during the Great Depression. And the US was a net exporter of many farm goods. And so now all of a sudden, as a result of the Smoot-Hawley tariff of 1930, which was a completely unnecessary piece of legislation. It was passed by the House before we had even entered uh, the Great Depression. It was purely a partisan measure, um, not designed to combat the Great Depression. Um, and then there, of course, there's a debate, as you mentioned, about how much it led to the Great Depression. Uh, but there's no doubt that the, it was, uh, at the time, the um, uh, perception that the Smoot-Hawley tariff led to foreign retaliation against US farm exports began to activate the Midwest a little bit in terms of thinking about, well, actually, if we want to lead to an have an economic recovery and farm price growth will be a very important part of this, we have to think about exports. And one thing that Congress did not do when it passed an import tariff bill, such as Smoot-Hawley, is think about the consequences, the negative consequences for exports. They did not think about the foreign retaliation that would hit U.S. manufactured goods and farm goods. And so it's when the Roosevelt administration takes uh, power in 1933, they really begin to shift U.S commercial policy towards thinking once again about international engagement. They can't accomplish much during the 1930s, although they do, do take some important steps, but that was sort of the change, changing uh, direction of US trade policy away from just focused on import tariffs, focused on economic isolation, isolationism to thinking about the world market is sort of important for us and could be a force that we could harness to get out of the Great Depression. Uh, at the same time uh, that this is taking place, uh, Charlie, uh, we're, we're also starting to see a renewed debate about re-engagement uh, to the world in the 1930s with, of course, the, the rise of Nazism in Europe. By, by 39, the, uh, the expansion of the German em Empire and the, the beginning of World War II and, and this debate that takes place uh, throughout the country, but uh, uh, very strongly here in Chicago with uh, as headquarters of the America First movement, uh, the councils played a, a pretty large role in trying to push the argument for uh, American engagement and entry in, into the war. Uh, 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 how, how did that debate really uh, change? We know why it changed and when it changed, but how, do, how did that debate evolve and the balance of power evolve, even as you have an election in 1940? Uh, uh, of the, the singular election of, of Roosevelt thinking he, he's the only one that can keep the United States uh, together in this period. Uh, how, what's the, paint the picture uh, of that debate and the politics that exists then, and then we'll go and talk about what the consequences all of this were. Sure. <clears throat> well, you know, it's just so that you Midwesterners don't feel too guilty about this. Uh, I want to, I want to stress that even though sectionalism played a role, different parts of the country owned isolationism at different periods. You know, there were times when 
The Northeast was internationalist because it supported shipbuilding and the South was isolationist. There were times when the South was internationalist because it supported Woodrow Wilson. So they're really, what's very interesting to me about isolationism, what I learned when I read, when I wrote the book I published last year is that it has something for everybody. It has different kinds of ideological dimensions, which is one of the reasons that it lasted as long as it did during the 1930s. So just to give you some of the, the different ways it was able to dominate political life during this period, I'd say, first of all, and both Doug and Margaret have mentioned this, you, you have the economics, which is in, during the Great Depression, uh, Roosevelt basically decides that he's going to focus on the American economy like a laser, that he needs to get on board his op opposition, Republicans in particular, for the New Deal. And that meant that he did not want to push them when it came to isolationism and the neutrality acts that were passed during this period. In other words, this was the beginnings of a focus on the American economy first, geopolitics second or third. Racism is an important part of isolationism, really from the beginning. They're not logically tied together, but if we look at, at, the, at the history uh, from an empirical perspective, we do see that oftentimes anti-immigrant sentiment and geopolitical isolation ran together. 1924, just after we rejected the League of Nations, Congress passed some of the most draconian anti-immigration legislation in American history, and it was not just targeted at Asians, it decreased immigration of Catholics and Jews by 90%. About a million Mexican Americans were deported during this period, many of them US citizens, right? So there were lots of different strains of isolationism that were running together in the 1930s. And Roosevelt really wasn't willing to take them on. My, my final comment is that, you know, we remember Roosevelt as a great wartime leader. He's the one who, who turned the corner. He took the United States into war. But it's important to keep in mind that even Roosevelt was putting the brakes on right up until Pearl Harbor. He did back away from strict neutrality. He got Congress to approve cash and carry. He began to, to give old destroyers to those that were fighting Nazism and fascism. But there was no clear indication that he was ready to go to war, that he was ready to take the country to war until Pearl Harbor. 80% of the American electorate opposed entry into the war. We did have public opinion polls by this time. So that gives you some sense of the political environment against intervention right up until December 7, 1941. Margaret, um, uh... Uh, comment on, on 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 that part of the of the isolationist debate, if you want, on the political side and the and the strength of the isolationist movement to to uh, to include the president and and his and his administration up to uh, Pearl Harbor. Uh, uh, but also, I'd like you to start thinking what the, the reaction to this period once the war starts, once we do become involved, and how that sort of changes. America's outlook and the outlook of our leaders towards how to think about our, our role in the world. I think when we think of isolationism, I think particularly in the 1930s, we have to remember the United States was by no means alone in trying to pull up the drawbridges and look after its own. I mean, one of the things that happened as a result of the Great Depression or the beginning of the Great Depression was that nations tried to protect their own industries and their own peoples and they put up tariff barriers, which in fact was going to be hugely damaging because it meant world trade fell, I think, by about a half. Professor Oman will, will know better than me. But that you know, the, the, the sort of looking after your own, in fact, reverberated through the world so that everyone, or pretty much everyone, was worse off. And it tended also to drive electorates towards the extremes. Um, you know, people were desperate. Um, everything was crumbling. Their pensions no longer meant anything. They couldn't get jobs. And in those circumstances, you will get people turning to those often who produce very simple solutions. You know, I know what the answer is. It's capitalism or it's this or it's robber barons or it's, it's plots. And I think it feeds into to what Professor Kutchin was talking about, the sort of sense of in isolation that somehow the outside world can be contaminating. I mean, even the language that was used, you know, the infection that can come across the oceans from other peoples. But I think what is important about the period 
as we look at what happened after the Second World War is the lessons that those in positions of decision making actually drew from the period. And I think it's very significant. I mean, when we look at why people make decisions, I think we always need to remember what they're remembering and what they've just lived through. And so the leaders of the 1930s had lived through the First World War. In cases of Churchill, they'd been in the First World War. They had lived through the 20s and 30s. They had managed, as they saw it, to pull victory out of the Second World War. And it was a very hard and very costly victory. And they did reflect, and you can see this in their correspondence and their writings and their, their thoughts, even during the Second World War, when they had a lot on their minds, they reflected on where did we go wrong and what can we do to, to make things better? And a very important part of this was to try and set up new economic institutions, which would try and prevent the um, selfishness, does selfishness is the wrong word, but the, the focusing on your own interests in the 1930s to try and have institutions that would promote the free trade of goods and, 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 and investment around the world. And of course, it also was the impulse behind the United Nations to try and set up an international order which would deal preferably early on with, with aggression with a united front. And I think this is very important. You know, this was not just for, for appealing to their own public. So this was not just for propaganda. These were things that Roosevelt in particular, but so too did Churchill. Stalin, of course, is a different matter, took very seriously. How do we avoid repeating this again? Can the world afford a third world war? And the answer to them was no. And we have to take steps to prevent it. By that time, of course, we've also entered the nuclear age and, and it becomes even more important to, uh, to avoid to avoid war. And, and a key issue, uh, Doug, is, is economic relations and understanding that the depression, for all the reasons that we have talked about, reinforced isolationist, even xenophobic uh, uh, sentiment. And, and, and worse, of course, in, in Germany, it was the economic crisis that was a, a key cause of the rise of, of Nazism and, and, and of Hitler. And an understanding that you needed to prevent that. And, and, and so what was, what was the thinking in the 1940s, uh, during uh, during the time of the war, about the post-war economic system, what were the key elements that uh, uh, leaders thought needed to be put together in order to prevent that kind of um, depression and 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 economic uh, uh, vicious circle uh, that we had been just been living in? I think just as Professor McMillan just said, um, uh, the. the policymakers in the late 30s, certainly in the 1940s, were reacting to the era that they had just uh, witnessed and lived through. Um, sort of the failure to really establish uh, a ground rules for the world economy after uh, World War I, the onset of the Great Depression, much of which can be laid at the uh, footsteps of the gold standard and the failure to uh, establish a, a strong international monetary regime, the protectionism that came about, the collapse of the world economy, um, the rise of fascism, they saw political isolationism and economic isolationism as interlinked and interdependent and uh, both one of the same and one leading to the other, economic depression leading to political extremism, both on left and right. So particularly in the State Department and in the Treasury Department, they thought as soon as World War II came about, they began planning a, a post-war system. Um, and once again, focused on the trade aspects and the international monetary aspects. It wasn't so much, uh, I think, a societal consensus, um, but these, uh, but with Roosevelt's support um, and with the passage of time, particularly after um, Pearl Harbor, and I, I uh, keynote a couple people here, one of which is Arthur Vandenberg of the Republicans, who had been an isolationist, but really by 1943 or so said, you know what, uh, the 1930s was a disastrous decade. We have to really think anew. And he began to swing Republican support behind the Democratic initiatives of in world engagement and creating the GATT, the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, um, despite some resistance, uh, seeing that, that these things as necessary for, to establish a, a solid post-war economic foundation that would uh, preserve peace. Interestingly enough, these, these organizations in, in a changed form in the case of the GATT uh, evolving into the World Trade Organization, but the IMF and the World Bank remain today as, as, as major institutions. And, and, and I guess that sort of raises uh, a question and, and Charlie about sort of what was happening then and how can we think about what's happening today? Because some of the many, some of the forces, let alone the language of the 1920s and 30s uh, and the lessons that were learned 
uh, uh, in the 1940s and 50s seem to uh, both re-emerging in terms of negative forces and the lessons forgotten uh, in terms of, uh, of the positive way. Uh, are, we, uh, are we at the cusp of a new era of isolationism, at the cusp of a new era of, uh, of trade wars, uh, which you know, tariffs uh, on, on Chinese imports and, uh, and many other imports, including on our allies, remain in place even as we speak today. How should we think about what we know from that period of the interwar period uh, and what's happening today uh, in, the, in the political sense? I think there are some important parallels and some important lessons that we can draw. Uh, one of them, and this will be picking up on, on Doug's comment a minute ago about Vandenberg steering the Republicans behind engagement. Now, it's important to keep in mind how central Roosevelt's role was in cobbling together a bipartisan centrist consensus behind liberal internationalism. Because one thing that happened at the end of the 19th century is that Democrats and Republicans parted ways, largely over the 1898 war, right? The Republicans kind of became the party of unilateralism and power. The Democrats under Bryan became the party of multilateralism, the anti-imperialists. And they kind of stayed that way during uh, the first few decades of the 20th century. And it really wasn't until Roosevelt comes along that he combines these different traditions and he gives the realists hardcore projection of American power. He gives the idealists, the United Nations, international institutions, partnerships. And that really does forge a very strong bipartisan foundation that guides U.S. statecraft for decades and effectively meant that whether a Republican was in office or a Democrat was in office, it didn't matter that much. Statecraft didn't change. Well, one thing that's happened recently is that that bipartisan consensus is gone. And now when power changes hands in Washington, we swing wildly, right? We've gone from Clinton to Bush to Obama to Trump to Biden who knows what's next? And, and that is, I think, uh, something that we need to keep in mind. Secondly, you know, a lot of people saw Trump as some kind of bolt from the blue, someone who was at odds with America and American values. And I think in many respects, Trump was tapping into the older strains in American statecraft and American identity that we've been talking about this evening, Evo. You know, the, the unilateralism, the isolationism, the protectionism, the nativism, that's all part of American statecraft prior to Pearl Harbor, not much after Pearl Harbor. And in some ways, I think he was quite astute in tapping into these different traditions, particularly because they stayed alive and well in the American heartland. And so in some ways, I saw Trump as someone who was responding to a kind of primal scream in the American electorate, which was too much world, not enough America. You know, what about us? Why are we building schools in Kandahar rather than in Kansas? Uh, and that's similar to the reaction to World War I. That, you know, Margaret was saying how painful this was. What, and then there was the Nye Commission that investigated the role of the military industrial complex and in leading the nation into an unnecessary war. Uh, and so, yeah, there really was a sense, I think, that the U.S. had bitten off too much back in the 1920s, similar to today. The one big difference, I think, Evo, and one that should guide us moving forward, is today we are much more globalized and interdependent than we've ever been before, right? And so the idea that the United States can pull back, that it can get behind protective barriers, that simply doesn't make sense in a world in which climate change, in which pandemics, in which global economic interdependence, I think is probably irreversible. So we've got to figure out how are we going to manage this inward turn, this, this isolationist or neo-isolationist impulse at a time when the United States is more integrated into the world than ever before. Going to open up the conversation uh, uh, to to your questions, and if you have a question uh, for those who are uh, watching and or listening, go to your uh, web browser and type in ccga.live, and either uh, ask a question or vote for one that's already there. And we'll get to that in in, in a minute. Um, 
uh, Margaret, do you see the, the, the current era, sort of say the last five, seven years, as, um, as, as repeating what we might have had in the 20s, in, in, particularly in the 20s and the 30s? Are there new elements that we need to consider that are different? Uh, apart from the ones that I think Charlie points out that are, are deep uh, interdependence in the, in the rest of the world that makes an isolationist foreign policy uh, less, less possible. But how do you see the, 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 the parallels, but also the discontinuities and the, and, and the differences? Well, it's a very different United States than it was, say, at the end of, of the First World War, or even at the end of the Second World War. I mean, the patterns of immigration have changed. Um, there's been this huge movement of um, Black Americans from the South up to the North, which has changed the cities of the North. I mean, these are long-term trends, but the United States is, I think, a much more multiracial, um, perhaps more cosmopolitan society than it was. Uh, it's always been a society which has received immigrants, but I think that's different. I think what's also different, and, and Charlie was mentioning a number of the ways in which the United States is embedded in the world, what strikes me also is what's happened to war. Um, you know, the United States in the Second World War was attacked at Pearl Harbor, but the continental United States had one attack on it which killed some American citizens, and that was, I think, about seven people on a school picnic in one of the western states, I think, I think it was Washington State, when Japanese firebombs floated over. But in other words, there were, there were, were no major attacks by enemies on the United States, and of course that's now a possibility. It was a possibility during the Cold War, but because the Cold War was a sort of stalemate, thanks in part to nuclear weapons between the two sides, the prospect was there, but I don't think it was as, as live perhaps as, as it is now. I may be wrong, but it seems to me now with what's happening with weaponry, and we've seen the capacity of small terrorist groups to attack the United States. I think the United States, for what, whatever reasons, you know, whatever Americans may feel about it, is more engaged with the world at, the, at a number of, of different levels. Um, so I do think what's changed is the vulnerability, perhaps, of, of the United States. What also I think, but this again, I think you saw at the end of, of the First World War, but perhaps more pronounced now, you have the United States, which I think for a long time was very confident of itself, very confident of its power, felt that it was doing good, but also felt it could do what it wanted in the world. I mean, I think you see this very much during the Cold War, and you certainly saw it in the 1990s when a lot of people were saying the United States won the Cold War, you know, we are the superpower. And I see a United States, and, and I may be wrong because I don't live there, but I see a United States that has somehow lost its confidence that it no longer has the power that it thought it had and maybe no longer wants it. I mean, I get a feeling the United States and America, the American people don't want to pay the price of being a major power because it is a price. You know, this, 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 as, as Charlie Captain said, building schools for other people, spending a lot of money in other countries when we have problems here at home. And so I think the, a recent poll said that a lot of Americans really didn't care about being a superpower anymore. Um, they wanted their government to concentrate more on what was going on at home because being a superpower has an appeal, but it's also very costly. Uh, uh, to one of the first points you made about how different the country is. And, and I, I reflect on when I was ambassador at, uh, at NATO, one of the things uh, I, I did uh, frequently was visiting uh, the war graves, uh, of, particularly World War II war graves of Americans uh, around uh, uh, Western Europe. And, and the names of the people who, saw, who, who, who perished were largely European names, Italian, Irish, uh, 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 German, of course, uh, some Nordic. And then when you came home from that, you would read the, the, the people who were died in the wars we were finding then in Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, and, and they were very different, uh, not only much more Hispanic, but all of a sudden African names, people, uh, people from the Indian subcontinent, from Asia, uh, uh, just demonstrating in, in, in that particular way how very different the country had become um, uh, uh, as a result. So just, just reflecting on that. Uh, Doug, uh, 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 you, you made the point earlier uh, at, the, at the outset, and, and Charlie um, also made it, uh, about the importance of the political parties having a similar sort of framework and agreement about how to engage, and that that has broken down. And it, I'd argue it has broken down uh, not only on one side, it's broken down on, on all sides that there is no more a, a, a fundamental agreement uh, that is bipartisan about America's role and, and, and how to engage. In the economic realm, 
uh, how has how is this manifested itself, and what's the consequence? Yeah, we were talking about this earlier, maybe even uh, before we went live, about how um, the period of internationalism, the post-war uh, World War II period, has, has been the unusual period in American history, not not the the standard norm. And one certainly sees that when one looks at voting in Congress on, say, trade trade issues and, and authorizing the president to undertake tariff reductions and to agree to tra trade agreements. Very partisan um, from the 1930s and, and decades before, you know, Smoot Hawley was basically a party line vote. And then, as I mentioned, uh, with um, uh, Arthur Vandenberg bringing the Republicans around, if you look at the votes in the starting in the late 40s, right up through the 1980s, um, very little dissent, pretty easy to get trade uh, uh, agree agreements and, and trade negotiating authority through Congress, bipartisan agreement, not a lot of uh, divergence. And it begins to appear with NAFTA um, in the early 1990s when the Democratic support for trade agreements begins to fall, um, Republican support ha maintained uh, pretty high levels. And one sees that through the Obama administration um, and, uh, and what have you. And we see it today in the debate over the Trans-Pacific Partnership which is a little bit muted because President Trump was an unusual Republican in uh, not liking uh, trade and trade agreements, which is a deviation from the Ronald Reagan, um, George Bush, um, even Richard Nixon uh, and Dwight Eisenhower approach uh, as a Republican president. So now we are, uh, and notice that, that NAFTA occurs right after the uh, uh, end of the Cold War and the tearing down of the Berlin Wall. So that sort of end of the Cold War sort of begins to you begin to see the fragmentation in American politics on at least trade issues. I'm not sure about other foreign policy issues. And that's sort of where we are today, um, deeply divided over um, whether we should join the Trans-Pacific Partnership, how we should view the World Trade Organization and what have you. Division is certainly one of the things that uh, we recognize in, in almost anything that's happening in, in, in Washington in our politics. Um, uh, so that's, that's, that's a part of it and we'll We'll see where that leads. Uh, uh, um, uh, uh, let me let me let me turn to some of the questions that are uh, coming over the over the internet. Uh, and and if you want to ask a question or vote on the question that's already out there, uh, go to your browser at ccga.live. The first one is, uh, and, and Charlie may be good to tee it up for you. Um, although I'd love to uh, get the perspective of everyone. The Biden administration has talked about a foreign policy for the middle class. It's elevated this idea of we need to demonstrate how our engagement abroad benefits people here at home. Um, the question is, is that a form of isolationism? Should we look at this idea as an isolationist foreign policy, which is in some sense what some of our friends and allies think it is? Uh, or is it actually an attempt to address some of the issues that, that you mentioned earlier, uh, the deep unhappiness that may exist and demonstrate that, it, that engagement is necessary and here's how it benefits them? How do, you, how do you look at it? You know, I think that question, Evo, builds nicely off where, where Doug finished in talking about the divide that exists in the, in the country today. Because I think a foreign policy for the middle class does have a foreign policy dimension. Uh, and I think it has to do with the pullback from Afghanistan and the Middle East, where Democrats and Republicans alike have basically said, it's enough, it's enough already, let's pull back. I think it has to do with easing off on the free trade front so that uh, the trade deals that we do strike do more for average working Americans. But mainly, I think a foreign policy for the middle class manifests itself in terms of a focus on domestic policy. And if I were to sort of identify one area that I think is crucial to rebuilding a domestic consensus about global engagement, it is the big investment packages that now Congress is grappling with. Because in my mind, Roosevelt was able to cobble together bipartisanship in part because everybody's boat was floating up. The industrial American heartland was booming. As Margaret said, people were moving from the South to the North to get good jobs in ports and at factories. It led to a pluralism and a mixing in the United States that has some, to some extent been reversed by deindustrialization. And so I think the most important aspects of the quote unquote foreign policy for the middle class are spending less time and money on building Afghanistan and more time and money 
getting high speed internet access into rural America, getting child care into the hands of more Americans, getting health care, getting green technology. I think this is the best way to try to repair the country's politics, but also to revive its internationalism. Foreign policy, in my mind, does start at home. Margaret, does foreign policy start at home? Do, is, is, is it the foundational that it has to, that one has to focus at home and that a foreign policy for the middle class, since 95% of Americans think they are in the middle class, uh, that really is for Americans uh, in some ways. Is that how um, uh, we should think about this, or is it just another form of, uh, of isolationism and, and an, an excuse not to be engaged? I think it does matter in democracies. I mean, you, no government or series of governments can carry on policies for a long time in a democracy which the people don't support. And I think there are constraints on, on leaders and policymakers in democracies, which are probably a very good thing, that they cannot go too far away from what their people think is important. And I think good foreign policies in democracies reflect that. I mean, it's a very different matter. You know, if you have an authoritarian regime, um, a regime such as China, for example, I don't suppose that Xi Jinping and those who make Chinese foreign policy worry that much about what the Chinese people think. Um, you know, they, they keep very tight control on the means of communication in China. And I think they are prepared, if necessary, to sacrifice some of the interests of the peoples at home for a greater China abroad. And that was certainly true of the Soviet Union. But I think in democracies, unless you can get a degree of support, and I think perhaps elites, those who've been making policy, haven't always been that good at explaining to people in their own countries, in their own democracies, why it is they're doing what they're doing and why it's good for the country. And I'm afraid the example of Afghanistan, which, which Professor Cupton just meant, mentioned, is going to really cast a shadow over foreign policy in the United States and elsewhere. In Canada, too, we were involved. And what people here are saying is, what was it all about? 20 years and what did we achieve? What a waste. And that the trouble with that is it's going to make people take, take the next sort of step logically and say, all such foreign engagements are not worth it. And, and that, I think, is a shame. But governments have to do a better job of explaining and, and perhaps a better job of managing foreign policy. I think that uh, the, the latter point on, on, on Afghanistan, I think, is reverberating in all of uh, all of the countries that participate. And of course, Canada was was very much on the front lines for so many years as part of it. And, and it is a question that, uh, frankly, not a lot of people have asked, let alone answered. Uh, certainly, our, our leaders haven't uh, done so uh, respectively. Uh, um, uh, Doug, a, a really uh, a question, I think, really for you, uh, that was posed here, uh, it, it is about uh, Peter Zian's argument in the accidental superpower uh, that the Brennan Woods arrangement that we talked about uh, really lost its underlying justification when the Soviet Union uh, collapsed and, and the U.S. Uh, as an industrial power and a power that had more capability than almost any, anyone else didn't need trade as much as so many other countries. Is that perhaps an explanation for why there seems to be this retreat? Uh, from uh, in economic engagement uh, that we have seen over the last few years, that it is um, um, uh, the system is, is no longer necessary for the United States to achieve what it, what it wants to achieve? Well, I mean, I think I would distinguish between uh, the World Bank and the IMF, the Bretton Woods institutions and the WTO, which as you mentioned earlier, was the uh, uh, successor organization to the GATT. Uh, in some sense, the IMF lost its rationale with the uh, ending of the uh, the closing of the gold window by President Nixon 50 years ago in 1971, and we moved to a regime of flexible exchange rates, market determined exchange rates. The whole impetus behind Bretton Woods and the creation of the IMF was we'd have fixed exchange rates, and the IMF has been uh, uh, searching for a role since. Uh, I think they found a constructive role, particularly in the 1980s and 1990s with financial crises and helping developing countries uh, improve their economic performance. But it's it's certainly not the post-World War II or the immediate uh, 1944 Bretton Woods uh, uh, idea of what the, the IMF would be doing. Um, the WTO, I think, even in for a an more or a neo-isolationist United States, the WTO still, uh, I think, has a, a useful purpose for the United States. Um, we are... Uh, much more engaged in trade than we were in the 1920s and 1930s. Um, the health of the US economy, as we see now with supply bottlenecks around the world, much more bound up with uh, the world economy than uh, in previous decades. And therefore we want stability, predictability, um, 
in some form in which uh, trade disputes can be um, adjudicated, um, some rules of the road, if you will. And so even if uh, you know, we don't want to engage in new trade agreements, I think we would certainly want to preserve uh, the fabric of, of, of the supply chains that have, have built up uh, in recent decades. And the WTO is one mechanism, one institution, which we can have those discussions and try to preserve that. Uh, we're, we're, we're getting close to the end. And, and, and uh, one of the questions uh, that was asked here, I'm going to modify slightly and, and, and see if I can get all three of you to, um, to put your final thoughts on this. Uh, and, and that is the question of what role do, do institutions like the Chicago Council on Global Affairs or the New York Council on Foreign Relations, indeed Chatham House uh, uh, and the British Institute for International Affairs and other organizations like this and others like the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace that came uh, two to four in the immediate aftermath of World War I with a particular view about what was important and how the world ought to be uh, organized in, in, in promoting peace and promoting into uh, cooperation and promoting uh, working together uh, 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 at that time. What role is there for institutions like that? How effective were they back in the 20s? And importantly, what is it that, that a, a, a more public and a grassroots engagement on the question of uh, an international role can play today? And in the future, particularly in the divisions that we have talked about, the reemergence, some of the fissures that we saw in the 30s in our own politics. Is there a role for those institutions, for civil society more broadly, I guess? Um, uh, Margaret, let me start with you. Uh, when you reflect on the 30s, what, what do you think about their effectiveness? And importantly, what can, we, what can uh, uh, institutions like this do going forward? Well, I think if we don't discuss issues and, and don't try and inform ourselves, then we don't have much hope of, of finding solutions to the problems it faces. And I think they're actually very important, such institutions today, as they were in the 1920s and 30s, in educating, in bringing people together. I mean, we live in, in what is sometimes a very atomized society. I mean, the spread of social media um, has, I think, tended to atomize people rather than bringing them together. And I think what these institutions can do can provide a forum, a very important forum in which people can discuss politely different points of view. And you know, the, too much of our, our discussion now seems to be people shouting at each other through megaphones, um, shouting slogans or tweeting in, in you know, short bursts. And that's not the sort of discussion we need to deal with the sorts of problems we have. So I actually, I think they're more important than ever. Big divisions, uh, silo, uh, uh, atomization of society, Doug. Uh, that reasoned, uh, reasoned debate can overcome. Uh, universities could, can, can be contributors, of course, of that too. I think it's a very important for a sort of post-university education of the American public in, in general and a forum for debating ideas and a forum for coming up with new ideas. Um, I think uh, Charles pointed out that uh, you know, foreign policy begins at home. Well, the State Department and the President can't speak to the American people every day about foreign policy. They're not going to resonate, but I think it's forums like this and institutions such as yours that really engage people and, and talk about the issues that um, are very important, but uh, uh, there's really no other uh, way in which to do so. It's not going to come from Washington. It has to be more locally based, talking to local businesses and civil society and, and citizen groups and what have you, um, and, it, and it sort of percolates in the system. Um, so I think the educational role is, is vital. Charlie, uh, as, a, as a senior fellow of the Council of Foreign Relations, uh, talk about, about the, the, these organizations as well, but also uh, you've been in government, uh, and, and, and Doug might want to come back on this too. Is there a role for government to think about uh, the people that they serve? There is a famous story that George Schultz, whenever a, a new ambassador uh, was about to be sent out to post uh, would, would uh, walk over to a globe and say, so where's your country? And they would point out Vietnam or Laos or Nigeria. And he said, no, 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 no. This, pointing to the United States, is your country. This is your country. Uh, and, and, and sort of a lot of people in Washington have forgotten there's a whole country out there that they're supposed to be part of. Is that part of the responsibility as well uh, as how to think about it? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with everything that, that Margaret and, and Doug have said. Uh, you know, the places like the Chicago Council, the CFR, Chatham House, there are, there are many of them, do, I think, leaven debate. They contribute ideas 
Uh, and sometimes those ideas actually enter uh, the policy world. You know, they, they, they become part of the discourse, they matter. Uh, the, you know, the ideas of the League of Nations and the United Nations, they didn't come out of nowhere. There was, a, there was a, uh, something called the League to Enforce Peace that was dealing with this ideas in, in kind of an, an NGO format. And then politicians come along and they, and they hop on these ideas. And so we do have a, a role to play, not just in contributing to public debate, but in contributing big ideas that in some cases actually find their way into the policy realm. I think that that one frustration that I have, and, and Evo, I'm guessing you have felt this too as the head of the Chicago Council, is broadening our reach in the sense that, you know, we do tend to end up including in our conversations people who, uh, who self-select, people who are interested in these topics, who may be international business uh, uh, partners, and as a consequence, they have vested interests. And I think particularly in this day and age, we have to do, uh, do more to reach out to people that may not ordinarily be interested in these issues. As Margaret said earlier, you know, this is a big country, and if you live in the middle of it, you may not care that much about what goes on in Indonesia. And so we do need to find ways, I think, to broaden the debate and to show average Americans why these big issues matter to them, why trade matters, why Afghanistan matters, why the rise of of China matters. That's that's uh, an important part of conducting foreign policy in a democracy. Uh, I think that's uh, those are wise words. I think I, when it comes to trade, uh, the farmers in Kansas and Iowa really do know that trade matters. Um, that's uh, that's part of part of what get them motivated. But it's part of that. It's understanding how we're all. Uh, uh, integrated together and working together is, is part of it. Uh, it remains a mission for the next hundred years of the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. This has been a terrific conversation uh, about really uh, hard issues, but I think you've you've made them uh, come alive uh, in in only a way that true historians and, and scholars like you uh, are able to do. I want to thank Margaret McMillan, uh, Douglas Irwin, and 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 Charlie Cupchin for being part of it. They are uh, uh, terrific scholars, written uh, wonderful books, which I do encourage you uh, uh, to purchase uh, at the seller uh, bookstore or wherever uh, books are sold these days, which is just about anywhere as long as you have a computer. Um, uh, and I just, uh, again, want to thank you for a really, truly enlightening conversation uh, and wish you all uh, the very best. Thank you. Thank you, Eva. It's been a pleasure. Thanks. Thanks very much.